When we last saw Ash, he had become the champion of the Kanto region, contrary to what happened in the anime. Now, Ash and his friends are heading for New Barktown and the Johto League. To find out if he's strong enough, I will attempt to beat Pokemon Crystal as Ash using his exact team for every major battle, in addition to a few other rules. Let's see if he can become a two-time champion. Ash may look a little bit different in Crystal, but don't you worry. I'm still the same dumb, lovable kid that everybody adores. Do you have any cash in case they charge a fee? Apparently, my house has had a makeover, and it now includes the most informative text box I have ever seen. Downstairs, I find out that my mom has also had a makeover. She asks me what day of the week it is, but I'm just some kid, I don't know. And then she tells me to not touch that dial to change daylight savings time back and forth. It's a hack you can do in this generation to dramatically increase the number of phone calls you get, making it seem like you have friends. So naturally, I did it all the time. Speaking of friends, but real ones, it's time to talk about this video sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. Now, I'm sure you've heard about this game by now. After all, it's celebrating its fourth birthday this year, and these Death Knights have grown up so fast. But in case you've been living under a Geodude for the past four years, let me explain. In Raid, you gain rewards, experience, and loot for defeating enemies and bosses. If you want to take a break from destroying some dragons, even though it's pretty fun, then make sure you check out the arena where you can face other players' champions. But first, you need to have some good inventory. Not only are there over 600 champions to choose from, you can also upgrade them and give them different sets of equipment to boost their stats and give them perks. And once your team is all ready, it's time to destroy some monsters and some giant bosses. This is how you get those rewards we talked about at the very beginning. One of the big pluses for me in this game, aside from everything we've already talked about, is the auto battle feature. Sometimes you're just too busy to be on your phone. That's called life. But with Raid's auto battle, your champions can level up and get rewards basically all on their own. So if you haven't started playing yet, what exactly are you waiting for? And to celebrate Raid's fourth anniversary, there are tons of awesome perks like dedicated offers, free gifts, promo codes, events, and a brand new fusion event where you can get an anniversary themed legendary champion. You'll also be able to take a trip down memory lane with a recap video of your stats in Raid. How many champions did you pull last year? And if you're a Prime member who just got Gembo, be on the lookout for some powerful Savage gear available now till the end of the month. You can get the epic champion Kellen the Shrike and various loot just by scanning this code or clicking on the link in the description. And once you're in the game, come and find me under the name Nuzlocke Joe, obviously. Maybe we can be on the same clan. When I go outside, I don't recognize my surroundings. I swore that I went to sleep last night in Pallet Town, so what's going on here? Professor Elm explains that I'm in New Bark Town, and he agrees to give me a new starter. That doesn't actually happen in the anime, but since I'm already here, I decide to rescue this Chikorita a few episodes early. Once in a blue moon, Ash doesn't get lost. And so, in short order, we arrive in Cherry Grove City. And this is where the fun begins. You see, after completing the Kanto region, I transferred all of my Pokemon from that yellow version to this version of Crystal. To be clear, they are the exact same Pokemon with the same moves and stats. The only difference is that I had to lower their levels to make this, you know, a somewhat fair fight. With that being said, I am allowing the Pikachu to keep his Light Ball. After all, every Pikachu that comes from Yellow to a Generation 2 game has a Light Ball. Now even though I have the same Pokemon as before, I'm going to avoid using Kentonian Pokemon in any battles unless Ash specifically uses them. The obvious exception to this is Pikachu, who will basically always be on my team. He's Pikachu. I do the Mr. Pokemon stuff, even though this guy is not in the anime, and then Oak pretends not to recognize me. I was gonna give him a piece of my mind, Ash isn't using it anyway, but I'll give him a pass. Old people sometimes forget things. At least he gives me another Pokedex, like he's supposed to. After that, I revive my rivalry with Gary, who has also had a makeover. But you can tell he's the same guy, because just like the real Gary, he uses an Eevee. Ash actually loses this battle, but I choose not to. A single Thunderbolt takes him out. At this point, I hadn't yet decided to downgrade Pikachu's moves, because he does know Thunderbolt in the show, but since I am letting him keep the Light Ball, which doubles Pika's special attack, having these strong moves is a bit overkill right now. So I do get rid of him. Elm 
like apparently everybody else in this world, is surprised that Pokemon lay eggs. Which is a discovery, I suppose, but where exactly did they think new Pokemon came from? It's almost as if none of these guys have ever heard about the Pidgeys and the Beedrills. Maybe because all of their fathers are missing. Either way, Elm tells me about the Johto Pokemon League, and since I'm already champion in Kanto, I might as well go for another. On my way to Violet City, Ash encounters a Heracross. But he doesn't so much catch this guy as lure it with his Bulbasaur. As a kid, these scenes were always a bit weird to me because Bulbasaur obviously doesn't like it. But as an adult, they're even worse. Still, it's a sappy ending, for Heracross at least. I talk to this guard, who unlike his Cantonian counterparts, doesn't arbitrarily stop you just because he's thirsty. Congrats on, you know, doing your job, man. I arrive in Violet City and have several uneventful bouts with Sprouts in the aptly named Sprout Tower. This includes Sage Lee, who gives me the HM for Flash that I don't ever plan on using. With that, it's time to fight Flyer with Fire, as I enter the first gym. Faulkner leads with a Hoot Hoot, and Ash decides to send out Chikorita. But this actually ends up going okay, because this owl doesn't know any flying moves. So even though I have a type disadvantage, we can trade tackles back and forth, and Chikorita is the winner. By the way, as you can see here, I have modified the gym leader's Pokemon to match their anime teams. Pretty cool, huh? But just like Paper Beats Rock, for some reason, an illegal Charizard beats an illegal Pidgeot. Since Charizard won't be with me that much longer, spoiler alert, I decided to let him keep his strong moves. It still takes two flamethrowers to take out the bird. His last Pokemon is Dodrio, so I bring out Pikachu on a tackle and take it out with a Thundershock. These birds apparently belong to Faulkner's dad, so he at least did hear about the Pidgeys, but maybe not the Beedrills. Who knows? As far as first gyms go, that one was actually really smooth. Unfortunately, Charizard's burning ambitions to become Johto champion are thrown out the window the second he sees a female Charizard. And we know she's a female because of the bow, obviously. By the way, this lady is a bit of a weirdo. The smell of Charizard is very subtle, but unmistakable. Ugh. To be fair, the real reason Charizard stays with this girl who doesn't understand personal boundaries is because he wants to learn from the elder Charizard who easily defeated him multiple times. But that just makes this scene all the sadder, as Ash runs away from the Charizard Valley, leaving his arguably strongest Pokemon behind. And if you don't want to be left behind, subscribe to my channel, Nuzlocke Joe, to get frequent Pokemon challenge videos. And consider checking out my Patreon to directly support videos just like this one. Elm scientist buddy tries to pawn the Togepi egg off on me, but Misty is the one who's supposed to get it, not Ash. Did you even watch the show, scientist man? Come on. Another guy tries to sell me something, and it ends up being a slow poke tail for a ridiculous amount. I remember nine-year-old me being horrified that anyone would hurt a little slow poke by cutting off its tail. Outside of Union Cave, before I get to Azalea Town, I do some good quill hunting and find myself a cute little Cyndaquil. I haven't mentioned this yet, but the sprites in this game are freaking terrific. Just look at how great that Pikachu is. It's a huge step up from Yellow, which was already a giant improvement from Red and Blue. And this game came out 23 years ago. Crazy. In Azalea Town, I talk to old man Kurt, who wants to stop Team Rocket from exploiting innocent little slowpokes. And he immediately falls into a well. So I defeat them. Not just the guys though, the women too. I am an equal opportunity rocket beater. And after I've done all the work, this old man's back is magically better. Convenient that. At least he does give me a lore ball like he's supposed to. And he wants me to go around getting apricorns for this. Okay. With the city saved, it's now time to get the bugs out of the gym. Bugsy starts with a spinner rack and I with Cyndaquil. Now normally this would be a simple fight, but at this point in the show, Cyndaquil can't control his fire very well, so I need to stick with tackle. Eventually, Cyndaquil takes out the spider, only for its ghost to immediately reappear. This is obviously just a bug, pun totally intended, because of my programming. I hate to break it to you, but black and white level zero Spinarak are not a thing. So because it doesn't really matter, I use Ember to see what happens next, gain zero experience, and then see a non-ghost level zero Pidgey. That's enough of that, time to fix this. This time around, Bugsy only has three Pokemon. That looks a lot better. Having learned my lesson from the last time, Cinda uses Leer first, and then a few tackles to once again win. Out comes the normal Metapod, so I bring out Chikorita. And by the way, 
this is the second gym in a row that Ash brought her out on a type disadvantage. But this time, all I do is use Reflect, just in case the Scyther, in the back, gets a bit out of control. I then pivot to Pikachu on a string shot to take out the Metapod in one hit. The Scyther survives the first Thundershock to use a Fury Cutter and then uses Quick Attack before dying. Even without fire, that battle was super easy. And now, I get to bypass any Totodile duel because Misty isn't around. But let me just warn you to not watch this episode late at night. It has some of the most vicious Pokemon fights you've ever seen. Now I'm supposed to catch this guy with a lore ball, which doesn't make sense because it wasn't a fishing encounter, but it fails anyway. Great ball it is, little guy. As I try to leave Azalea Town, Gary shows up and wants to battle again. His Ghastly is super easy and falls in one Thundershock. His Eevee has evolved into an Umbreon, which is not as good as Espeon, but still pretty cool. Pikachu deals some damage and paralyzes the Umbreon, but does get sand attacked. I decide to bring out Heracross, who should be able to finish him off and that tackle did basically nothing. But I do want to use Heracross as much as I can right now, so I'm going to leave him in. A few tackles later, and the Umbreon eventually does fall. For the Zubat, Heracross still stays in and does a decent amount with two tackles. But after seeing how much he does to himself while confused, I don't want to risk anything. So, out comes Totodile in his debut fight to win with a few scratches. Good for you, little guy. Yes, Gary. I won because I am stronger than you. That's usually how these things go. I pull a far-fetched tail, messing with him a couple times and forcing him to bump into a tree. Ash is truly a monster. It's also around this time that I get the mysterious GS ball. I was baffled by what this thing did in the anime, and the answer ended up being a big ol' pile of nothing. So I give it to Kurt, the guy who is such an expert on Pokeballs that he can tell me this is not a Pokeball. Yeah, it's also not a Master Ball. See, I can do it too. Next. Ash puts Heracross into the box to bring out his Tauros and learn the trick of the trade when it comes to bull running. Since there is nothing like this in the game, I just run around the Poke Center instead. Super exciting stuff. Next episode, Ash puts Tauros back in the box, but decides to leave Heracross there because he's an idiot. That makes no sense to me, Heracross is awesome. He does, however, send Squirtle to the firing squad where he belongs. You know, the place where they fight fire rings with their water? He takes his rightful place back at the top of the Squirtle Squad. Goodbye, my friend. You were actually really helpful in Kanto. It's around this time that Syndical plays with matches, don't do that at home, and ignites the fire on his back. To celebrate, I fight Pokefan Brandon and his Snubble. Though Ember is not even a three-hit KO because this random trainer had a berry. That was mighty anticlimactic. Gary and Ash then have a race on some extreme Pokemon, and for the first time, Ash beats Gary at something. It's nothing important like a Poke Battle, but at least it's something, right? I'm still not sure how an Arcanine, who literally learns the move Extreme Speed, can lose a race to a Leaf Dinosaur, but I guess Ash needed a victory. I'm then given another egg by the Daycare Man, but I still have the first egg that Elm pawned off on me, so why do I need another? In the National Park at night, I change the wild encounters so that Hoot Hoot is the only one I can find. This is because Ash catches a shiny Noctowl, and this will be a lot easier if I don't have to worry about other Pokemon. However, after a thousand encounters or so, I have gotten tired of this foul play. I had intended to catch this shiny guy legitimately, but even with super speed, 1 in 8192 odds is not great. So I bite the bullet to dramatically increase the odds, and since I'm cheating anyway, I might as well make it a Noctowl. And now I have a goldenrod opportunity to face off against Whitney. She leads with Nidorina against my Totodile. I start by lowering her defenses and using Rage, which gets powered up because she keeps kicking me. It doesn't take long for the Totodile to win. The Clefairy does survive a Rage, and I need to bring out Cyndaquil to enact my Miltank plan. Unfortunately, his Ember is ridiculously weak, and Clefairy survives, getting a Ground-type Bone Meringue in the process. Well, this is great. I'm probably going to lose this one. I was going to attempt a smoke screen against Miltank, but at this HP, that's not going to work. You might notice the Miltank is five levels higher than the level cap. That's because in the battle that Ash actually wins, he uses three Pokemon to finally defeat this single cow. Anyway, Pikachu comes in on a stomp, that does a ton of damage, and then is outsped and falls. This was my first loss. 
Just to remind you, this is not a Nuzlocke, so when a Pokemon dies, instead of them being unusable, I will simply restart that battle. This does increase the difficulty from a normal playthrough without making it nigh unbeatable. Ash does lose this fight the first time, so I think we're all good. Pikachu is unable to battle! The winner of this round and the match is with me! On the second attempt, I decide to set up double teams against the Clefairy. But in spite of all of my doubled teams, this not yet fairy continually sees the real me getting ridiculously strong double slaps. So that attempt also ends in failure. On the third try, I decide to start by smoke screening the Nidorina as much as possible. Cyndaquil can use three smoke screens before he's at risk, allowing me to pivot to Pikachu to attempt some more double teams. And this is working decently well. I do get hit a couple of times, but nothing as damaging as the all-powerful double slap, apparently. With six double teams, a single Thundershock takes out the Nidorina. The Clefairy takes a hit, uses spikes, and then falls. And now for the moment of truth against the Miltank. I start with Thunder Wave, hit a pretty weak Thundershock, and then immediately get curb stomped. So much for my plus six evasion. After a slight move change, I go for attempt number four. I start off with the same basic plan, which is lame, I know, but this cow is way too strong. This time around, Pikachu is barely hit by Nidorina and uses the more powerful Thunder Punch, which I bought at the department store. Clanot Fairy still survives a hit, but misses, giving me a decent shot against the tank of milk. It's just common sense to start with a Thunder Wave, and then three Thunder Punches takes out this Demon Cow, and this, my friends, is why I have PTSD from a children's video game. I've always hated this gym. It's not quite a dairy tale ending, however, because Whitney cries like a baby after losing. This is a stark contrast to the anime, where she is not only a good sport, but she insists that Ash takes the badge even though it wasn't an official battle. Before leaving Goldenrod, I try to meet DJ Mary on airtime, but end up just getting a darn radio card instead. In the National Park, they are hosting one of their tri-weekly insect grabbing competitions. Now you might know that by a different name, but that's trademarked. I loved these things as a kid. Right now, even though I'm looking for a very specific Pokemon, it doesn't stop me from throwing a park ball at a pincer just to see what happens. He doesn't get caught. After a few minutes, I encounter a Beedrill, who I do catch, and take to get judged. Unfortunately, I end up in third place because my Beedrill was pretty low leveled. I can't let the bug stop here though, because I need the Sunstone that first place gets. So let's try again, after releasing this guy into the wild. I alter the code just a bit to make higher level Beedrill appear, and so I get a level 19 giant wasp this time around. Third and second places both caught pincers, but my unusually high level Beedrill beats out both of them, winning me a sunstone. Yay! This will be minorly relevant later on. And even though I like this bug more than the last one, he still needs to go. I encounter a pseudo Wudo, who is apparently a Shakira fan. Surprisingly, Ash didn't see his first talking tree until Hoenn, which I didn't remember. I assumed there was an episode dedicated to this event in Johto, but apparently not. Conversely, Kecleon successfully capers himself into Johto, even though he's supposed to be in Hoenn. But this does happen a bit later. Brock, have you ever seen a Kecleon before? Never! Only in a Pokedex! I arrive in Necrotique City and find out that for Ho-Oh, the bell tolls. I meet this guy, don't want to try and pronounce his name, and then encounter Gary again. My Totodile manages to take out his Haunter with a couple of bites, but is cursed in the process. So I need to swap, Cyndaquil comes out to Ember the Magnemite, and he wins in two hits. I've gotten pretty tired of messing around here, so against Zubat, my ace, Pikachu, comes on out. The bat falls in one thunderful punch. The Umbreon is really tanky, so I paralyze him, take a few hits, and bring out the shiny Noctowl for the first time. Unfortunately, his best move is Peck, which is not that great. So, after almost dying to a lucky crit, I swap again, this time to Chikorita. And finally, after two last Razor Leaves, the Dark Fox is down. That was especially tough for some reason. Now it's my turn to fall into a hole and hurt my back. My cries of agony are so annoying that these dog statues awaken and run away. Ash actually did see Suicune all the way back in episode one, but it's not super important. Next, there is some trouble brewing with the Kimono Girls as I defeat all of their evolutions, getting the HM for Surf as a prize for picking on these girls. There's probably a lesson in there somewhere. Against Morty, I decide to unleash the Pikachu. He goes from ghost to ghost, defeating the Ghastly and Haunter in a single Thunder Punch each. He then levels up and learns Thunderbolt just in time to one-shot the Gengar as well. 
Bet you didn't know that a light ball Pikachu with a crap ton of EVs was really, really good. Remember when I said that Ash was a monster for picking on Farfetch'd? Well, he does it again by throwing a Sunstone at a wild Sunkern, forcing it to evolve. What happened to Consent? I try to do the same, but can't throw items at wild Pokemon. This forces me to catch this girl, waste the first evolution in the entire game on some flower, and then release her back into the wild. All the while, tolerating Todd Snap and his moving pictures obsession. And in this episode, Dexter straight up lies to me. The Sunstone enables evolution in several Pokemon, changing Gloom into Vileplume. Excuse me, everyone knows that a Sunstone will evolve Gloom into a Blossom, not a Vileplume. You need a Leaf Stone for that. What's wrong with you, man? Oak wants to study my shiny Noctowl for a bit, so Ash takes out his Snorlax to compete in a sumo competition. Being super fat, Snorlax inevitably wins to become the Ring Master. And his prize is to go right back to the PC. That's how you keep him loyal, give him just a touch of freedom every couple of months. Jumping ahead to current events, Chikorita defeats some random unimportant trainer and evolves as a result. She's only a couple levels late, so that's not too bad. I then return to Kurt to get the GS ball back. The voice of the forest seems to be saying something, so I investigate the shrine and find a convenient GS ball sized hole. I shove it in there, as one tends to do, and Celebi appears. This is an in-game event that never made its way to America. In Japan, you could get this by using some Pokemon mobile phone system. I'm not entirely sure how it worked. But now that I can finally access it, I decide to kill the Celebi because why not? And then, Kurt pretends like nothing ever happened. Right, just go back to normal. I harass some cows, because I hate them, and the farmer's wife straight up lies about her moo moo milk. Lady, I just came from Kanto. They are civilized and don't drink Pokemon milk. That's gross. I climb all the way to the top of this lighthouse, where a sick Ampharos is fighting for his light. Jasmine, being a responsible individual, demands that I, some dumb kid, go all the way across the ocean on my lonesome. Sounds fine to me. In the remakes, there is an elevator here, but since this game came out before the invention of elevators, I do what people did in the good old days, fall down some holes. I miraculously don't drown in the middle of the ocean and am able to face the Machoke Man. He proves he's tough by throwing a big boulder to try and impress his friends. He starts the battle with Machoke and I with Bailey. I first use a reflect, just because, and then take out the bodybuilder in a few razor leaves because one of them gets a crit. The Polyrath comes out and uses a Mind Reader. I'm expecting a dynamic punch here, but decide to stay in because why not? Even with a Miracle Seed, Razor Leaf appears to be a 3-hit KO. So Bayleaf desperately tries to hit through Confusion, but dies. I can't believe I lost to this guy. He doesn't even own a shirt. Now Pikachu could easily defeat him, but I want the newly evolved Bayleaf to do it on her own. How else is she going to learn? The second attempt starts off in much the same way as the first, with Machoke falling to a critical hit. This time, however, I give Bayleaf a Bitter Berry to heal Confusion, and the Polyrath decides to use Hypnosis instead. But he misses every single time, so Bayleaf wins. In all honesty though, that battle was a lot less about Bayleaf being strong than it was about Chuck being stupid. But hey, I'll take the victory. Ash and his friends take a fairly large detour before returning to Olivine City. They go around a Whirlpool and enter the World Cup, where Ash is defeated by Misty. I, however, am not. Now, that could be because there is no World Cup in Crystal, but just let me have this one, alright? I need this victory after losing to No Shirt Guy. I save Ampharos' life, and I'm ready to show off my nerves of steel. Hicks. Jasmine starts with a Magnemite, who Pikachu takes out in a single Thunderbolt. I can't really do anything to the Steelix, but my plan is to double team a few times to stall and see if he uses Sunny Day. No idea why he has that move, but it is what it is. The Steelix, however, is a jerk and does not oblige. After a few Iron Tails, I pivot to Cyndaquil, whose Flame Wheel is not enough, and then he dies in a Rock Throw. The Sun would certainly have been helpful there. For the second attempt, even though Ash did leave with Pikachu, I'm giving the honor to Cyndaquil. Magnemite, once again, falls in one hit. And the Steelix does too, because I get a crit. Well, alright then, didn't need the Sun after all. At this point, Bulbasaur becomes an ambassador and is sent to Oak's lab. But it's not really a big change for me in this run, because Bulba has not been on my team since the great Heracross Assault of 97. Too bad for him, Heracross was their weight. My innocence is lost as I get to the Lake of Rage and encounter an obviously sick Gyarados. So, being a responsible guy, I put him out of his misery before the sickness can spread. What an abomination. 
I aid and abet Lance in his criminal endeavors, and while we're hatching a plan to take out Team Rocket, I realize I forgot to turn my egg to silent. What a rookie criminal mistake. This does give me a fampy though, so that's something. With that, it's time to head to the seventh gym to see if I'm as cold as Price. He starts with Dugong, and I with Cyndaquil. This may not be a great start, but it's what Ash did. Even with Charcoal, my flame wheel does very little. A couple of headbutts later, and I bring out my ace, Pikachu. A single Thunderbolt is all it takes. Next is the ground type Pillow Swine, however, and I can't do much to him. Let's see if Cyndaquil can finish off this battle. And apparently he can, with two flame wheels and 20 HP left. That was actually pretty surprising. And all of the last three gyms have been 2v2, which feels a bit unusual. Normally we each get three Pokemon. I do all the Goldenrod Rocket stuff, but since it's not anime canon, let's forget about it. This does include another Gary fight, but I'm feeling especially lazy, so I just tell Pikachu to handle it. And handle it, he does. One-shotting all of his Pokemon, aside from the Umbreon, who takes a little bit longer, but Pikachu still does a great job. In her gym, Claire has a great bowl of fire, which seems mighty dangerous if you ask me. Kids can barely walk on the ground without tripping, and now we have them balancing on rickety rock bridges over a boiling lake of lava? I do have a few surprises for the battle, though. First, Snorlax is back. Unfortunately, the Kingdra spams smokescreen, and I proceed to miss three out of four strengths. Well, that was great. For the Dragonair, I bring out my second surprise, Charizard. He is then paralyzed and breathed on by the Snake Dragon. Gross. Eventually, after several turns of not moving, one last Earthquake takes out the Dragonair. Last is a non-sick Gyarados, so I decide to give Snorlax a bit more game time. I also decide to use Ice Punch, which isn't the best move here, but I just wanted to show you that I had it in preparation for the Dragonair. If only Kingdra had let me use it. I survive a Hyper Beam with two HP left, good job being so fat Snorlax, use Rest, and then immediately wake up thanks to a Berry. After a couple of strengths, the Gyarados falls. And eight badges is better than never. Granted, she doesn't give me a badge here because she's a horrible person. In the game. In the anime, she's fine. Well, Ash, that was a match I'll never forget. Here's your rising badge. That seems like a trend for some reason. But after being scolded by this old guy, she reluctantly agrees to do her job. With all eight badges, I return to New Bark Town and take my very first steps into Kanto aside from virtually every other step in my entire life thus far. At the end of Victory Road, Gary wants to challenge me one last time, so I might as well show the whole thing. My little Cyndaquil takes out his Sneasel in just a couple of flame wheels. I'm not sure how he got to Mount Silver already, but whatever. For his Umbreon, I pivot to Pikachu, obviously, who was sand attacked several times, but takes him out with two Thunderbolt hits. For his Magneton, I pivot to Fampy, who unfortunately doesn't have any ground moves, that was a bit of a mistake. Instead, I use Rock Smash a few times, and I hope for a defense drop. Eventually, these Rock Smashes do take it out, and I give Totodile a chance against the Golbat. After taking two wing attacks, he does less than half with an Ice Punch, which was not great. After one more wing attack, Noctowl comes out to finish off the bat. The Haunter survives the confusion just to confuse me. And after a turn of hitting myself, Haunter hits himself with a curse. That's fine by me. With the Haunter gone, I can swap out to Bayleaf as the Kadabra for Season Attack. But that attack never comes because Bayleaf knocks him out in two hits. And so, for the last time, Gary was defeated. We're never going to see this guy again. Towards the end of this season in the anime, Ash participates in the Silver Conference. He actually makes it into the top eight before losing. In the first set of matches, Ash uses six different Pokemon. So those are the only ones I'm taking to the Elite Four. The only problem is, they all kind of suck. Basically, I'm going to face the Elite Four with a team of completely unevolved Pokemon. Most of them starters. So, this is going to be rough. What is cool about Crystal though, is that the Gen 1 starters and Pikachu have unique icons here. But that's enough stalling, let's just get this over with. Against Will, I first decide to test the waters just a little bit. I don't expect my strat to work, but we'll see. I lead with Fampy against his Zatu. I start with a rollout, as the Zatu almost kills me with a single Psychic, and my rollout does like a quarter of his health. I do have a Quick Claw to try and let me outspeed, but nope, and that was a remarkably fast loss. I fail with that strat several more times. Even though I didn't expect it to work, I was kind of hoping deep down that it would. I do manage to defeat the Zatu with a lucky critical hit, and then Jinx Ice punches me in the face. Okay, let's get to the more realistic plan. 
I leave with Squirtle, who has never melt ice, and the Ice Beam crits, knocking out the Zatu. But his psychic did a lot to me in the process. This brings out Executor, and even though I don't think it's going to take him out, I go for another Ice Beam, that doesn't kill, and then my Squirtle dies to another Psychic. Several Squirtle attempts later, I get really lucky and manage to have an undamaged Squirtle make it to Will's third Pokemon, his Slowbro. I am Leet Seated though, so that kinda sucks. Squirtle is doing very little with Bite, as the Slowbro uses Curse and Amnesia. Since I'm not going to survive much longer, and the Slowbro is getting pretty buff, I take a risk to bring out Bulbasaur, who fails to get a critical Razor Leaf, and promptly dies to a Psychic. That was unfortunate. Alright, I didn't want to bring him out so soon, but it looks like I need the Electric Rat here. Pikachu outspeeds and one-shots the Zatu, easy peasy. Will sends out Jinx for only the second time, I think, who survives the first Thunderbolt, but decides to only use Double Slap. That's not so bad. Not sure why she didn't use Psychic, but whatevs. Since Executor certainly won't fall in one hit, I decide to paralyze him and just hope for the best. A great strategy, I know. The best does not happen, however, as he immediately hits through Paralysis and almost kills my Pikachu. Okay, I pivot to Squirtle on a Psychic, which was not great, but hopefully the Coconut Tree can be fully paralyzed for a single turn. Or not. What follows are several more attempts where sometimes the Jinx gets smart and uses Psychic instead of Double Slap. More often than not, after narrowly defeating the Jinx, Executor immediately takes me out. Eventually, the Executor is fully paralyzed, so Pikachu survives the encounter. I pivot to Cyndaquil, who hits with a charcoal boosted flame wheel, barely survives the Psychic, and for the first time in forever, the Executor falls. For the Slowbro, I swap to Squirtle, who does manage to hit with a really weak bite before succumbing to Psychics. I can't think of any way to dramatically improve my strategy here, so I'm just going all in with luck. It's not great, but I should have plot armor, right? Against the Executor, I decide to just leave Pikachu in and not waste a turn trying to swap. Thunderbolt appears to be a 3-hit KO, so it does require a bit of luck to avoid two of his psychics, but on this attempt, Pikachu actually does it, surviving with 18 HP. This could be the one, guys, until the Zatu comes out to quick attack me. Well, that was mighty disappointing. I thought I might actually have done it. After several more attempts, Pikachu again defeats the Executor, though with a bit more health left. Zatu apparently doesn't see a kill with Quick Attack, letting Pikachu finish off Will's last two Pokemon with Thunderbolts. And that was quite possibly the worst start to the Elite Four that I have ever had. In my 20 plus years of playing Pokemon, this was horrible. Things should go better in the next battles, at least I hope so. Next is Koga, so I leave with Cyndaquil with his Flame Wheel. The Ariados survives the first one, but only uses Double Team, which did not serve him well, apparently. The Fortress is four times weak to fire and doesn't have Sturdy in Gen 2. Now Muck is going to be an issue. I thankfully outspeed and proceed to do basically nothing with a Flame Wheel. That was a huge letdown. When Muck uses Venomize, I decide to use Smokescreen because two can play at that game. Unfortunately, I then get Toxic and smacked with a Sludge Bomb. Dang it, I thought he was going to spam Minimize a bit more than he did. The second attempt begins in much the same way, except that I missed the second hit, and Ariados uses Baton Pass to bring out Fortress. Between his Protect and me missing, it takes a few turns before the Fortress is actually hit, and he does use Spikes in the meantime. This time against the Muck, I pivot to Fampy on an Acid Armor, which isn't great because he got a defense boost, and then I get Toxic, but I do take him out with a few Earthquakes. Now Fampy does have a ground move, Ariados is back, and the Spider falls in one Earthquake. This brings out Venomoth, but I decide to stay in and see how much Earthquake does. It doesn't do quite enough, but at least I survive the Psychic. I bring out Squirtle because he has pretty good defenses and should be able to take out the Crobat next. First, Squirtle avoids both a Supersonic and a Toxic, like a beast, and surfs the Venomoth. After a double team, the Crobat is frozen with an Ice Beam. Go Squirtle! Koga heals with a full restore as Squirtle misses the next Ice Beam. After being Toxic, and wing attack it did, Ice Beam takes out Crobat for the win. Would you look at that? This one only took two tries, way better than the Will fiasco. Now it's on to Bruno, and I want to see if Bulbasaur can do this all on his own. The Hitmontop has basically no good moves, and he decides to go with Dig. But that's a pretty good move for me, because it gives me several turns to boost my special attack using Growth. I know that it's kind of cheap, and I wish there were another way around this, but give me a break, I'm using Bulbasaur against the Elite Four. Come on. On the turn before Hitmontop re-emerges from his second dig, I use Sunny Day. 
which obviously means my next move is a one turn solar beam. What else would it be? Bulba has a quick claw to try and help him outspeed, but Hitmonchan uses my own son against me with a fire punch. Thankfully, his special attack is absolute garbage, so I survive. Bulbasaur next manages to outspeed and one-shot both the Hitmonlee as well as the Forearms who comes out next. When the Onyx comes out, the sun does fade, but at this point I obviously don't need it. In case you couldn't tell, I plan for this battle just a little bit better than the one against Will. I'd like to think I've learned my lesson. Next, it's on to Karen. I again lead with Fampy and use Rock Smash to try and lower this Umbreon's defense. I want to try a rollout here just for fun, but with that sand attack, it's not a good idea. Instead, I bring out the Umbreon killer, Pikachu. This guy has taken out so many Umbreons in this run. For the Vileplume, I pivot to Cyndaquil on a Stun Spore, which isn't great, but my next two flamethrowers connect as I tank the Petal Dances. Gengar comes out, but since the only attacking move he has is Lick, I'm not really that concerned. After a bite and a curse, Squirtle comes out on a Destiny Bond, so it's a good thing I didn't use another bite. I use Rain Dance to see what Gengar is going to use next, and it's Lick. Sweet. So let's go for a Surf, and he just psyched me out. That was super lame. I was hoping to win first try again, but if Gengar starts spamming Destiny Bond, there's really nothing I can do. On the second attempt, a Quick Claw Fampy gets a rollout going, which is awesome. The Umbreon falls, as does the Vileplume. The Murkrow outspeeds and gets a critical feint attack, leaving me with only 5 HP. Against the Houndoom, my rollout ends, so I decide to swap to Squirtle, but the Houndoom uses Pursuit to attack the retreating elephant's butt. That was messed up. Okay, I'm done playing around, Karen. It's time to be serious here. And then the Umbreon proceeds to confuse Fampy and leaves my Totodile with a whopping 1 HP after a critical feint attack. Finally, I bring out Bulbasaur to finish him off. I pivot to Squirtle for the Houndoom, who gets burned by the Flamethrower. Well, this is going remarkably well so far. After a Surf, I swap to Pikachu on a Crunch, who responds with a Thunderbolt. The Vileplume is once again defeated by my Cyndaquil with just a couple of Flamethrowers. I stay in with the Gengar, so he wastes his curse on me, before pivoting to Pikachu, who avoids the Lick and electrocutes the Ghost. No Destiny Bond for you this time. Karen still has a Murkrow, but I plan to have Pikachu out at this point, so the bird obviously stands no chance. Karen was both more and less difficult than I anticipated. Does that make sense? I doubt it. It probably makes about as much sense as me trying to defeat the Elite Four with unevolved Pokemon. Who would do such a thing? Next, we have the champion, Lance. I naturally lead with Pikachu to Thunderbolt his not-so-scary snake. Against the first dragon, I bring out Squirtle, who is paralyzed. But that's okay, I saw it coming. I'm not sure if Squirtle can survive a hit here, and it's a thunder, because of course it is. This little guy still does survive, somehow, and responds with an Ice Beam for the knockout. Anticipating another Thunder Wave, I pivot to Fampy on a Twister. But this should bait out a Blizzard, so Totodile comes out to take the hit and dies to a Hyper Beam before he can use his Ice Punch. Okay, on the second attempt, I decide to go for a Thunderbolt against the first Dragon, and it does a decent amount, actually. Pikachu is then paralyzed, barely survives a Hyper Beam, but does manage to use Light Screen. Now, I get a free swap into Squirtle, and I'm hoping that the Light Screen will help him survive the Thunder. Or, Dragonite can, you know, just use Hyper Beam and bypass it completely. That was lame. Still, Squirtle does survive, taking out the first Dragonite yet again, but then falls to yet another Hyper Beam. Man, these dragons are jerks. On the third attempt, I start the same way by Thunderbolting the first Dragonite and getting paralyzed again. In case you were wondering, I can't give Pikachu a berry to heal that because he needs to have the Light Ball. This time round though, Pikachu goes for another Thunderbolt and takes him out. Against the second Dragonite, I pivot to Squirtle on a Twister. He wasn't going to waste a Hyper Beam with how low Pikachu's HP was. I get paralyzed, heal the paralysis, and miss out on the kill with an Ice Beam. Dang it, I thought I was going to kill him. Squirtle still does take him out, but only after another Hyper Beam. I am getting so tired of these things. And for the first time, we make it to the third Dragonite. I'm hoping he's going to miss, or do something stupid, so I go for Ice Beam, and am promptly killed by an Outrage. Well, at least it wasn't another Hyper Beam. On the fourth attempt, I get a bit luckier and get to the third Dragonite again, who confused himself with Outrage, allowing Squirtle to finish him off with an Ice Beam. Unfortunately, next is the Aerodactyl, and most of my Pokemon are damaged pretty badly because I had to keep swapping during that Outrage, so I can't really pivot. 
And what do you think this dactyl uses? Hyperbeam, of course. What else? Still, that's the farthest I've gotten so far. At this point, I decided to just see what Pikachu can do on his own because I've gotten tired. Instead of immediately killing the Gyarados like I have been doing, I want to stall the bit and see if he uses Rain Dance, which he does on the very first turn. Okay, after taking him out, I'm hopeful that a Thunder might be enough to kill this Dragonite. It isn't, unfortunately, but he misses his Thunder Wave, so that was pretty awesome. The same thing happens with the second Dragonite too. Wow. For the third and strongest Dragonite, even though they're all technically illegal here, I use Thunder Wave, hoping to fully paralyze this guy and get really lucky. Instead, I am Hyper Beamed in the face, but against all odds, my Electric Rat survives with 5 HP. And as long as Thunderbolt is a 2 hit KO, I should be able to win this. As it turns out, Thunderbolt is a 2 hit KO, meaning I wasted a turn trying to paralyze him. Oh well, Lance still has a Charizard, who poses no problem whatsoever. The Aerodactyl though, might be an issue. With my level advantage and EVs, I'm hoping that I outspeed, and I do, finally defeating Lance. This whole Elite Four attempt was really rough. Now, even though I am officially the champion in this game's eyes, the Silver Conference is not yet over. No, because Ash's second to last battle is against none other than his rival, Gary. The day has finally come when these two rivals must clash head to head. Now, I didn't quite lie when I said we'd seen the last of Gary, because now he has resorted back to his old appearance and is calling himself blue for some reason. The Elite Four matches were absurdly difficult, way more than I thought they would be. But for this battle at least, Ash's team is completely stacked, so I'm hopeful. Blue Gary, or Blue Gary for short, starts with Nidoqueen. Charizard is once again back from the Charcific Valley, which makes you wonder why I released him in the first place if he keeps coming back, but I digress. He takes out the Queen in two Earthquakes, taking basically no damage. You can't beat the Heat, Blagary. For the Golem, I pivot to Bayleaf on a Rock Slide and get fully healed with a four times effective Giga Drain. This baits out the Magmar, so I swap to Snorlax. After several smoke screens, I finally hit with a Surf, but only after Magmar used Sunny Day, weakening my water move. He still hasn't hit me at this point, so I stay in for a couple of flamethrowers and only manage to connect with one more Surf. This is lame. I bring out Muck as the sun fades and knock out the Magmar. Muck is pretty useless against Scizor, but Charizard comes out and gets a one-hit KO. Blagary's Blastoise is next, but I decide to leave Charizard in because they do have a showdown in the anime. A sun-boosted flamethrower does a decent amount, but the turtle takes away my momentum by making it rain. Yeah, it's time to swap. Bayleaf takes a rain-boosted hydro pump that still did less than half and outspeeds to heal a ton with a Giga Drain. I spam this move a few times as Blagary alternates between healing and hydro pumping, but I eventually run out of Giga Drain PP. Since the rain has faded at this point anyway, I get a safe swap into Muck to finish him off with a Thunderbolt. Or not. Dang it, I guess I'm just going to risk a crit here. Muck survives another pump with 9 HP and then the water turtle finally does fall. That guy was tough. Against Arcanine, I decide to let Tauros have a shot. He uses a stomp to try and flinch the dog and then finishes off the battle with a pink bow, aka Silk Scarf, boosted Thrash. In the anime, this actually marked the very first time that Ash had defeated Blagary in a Pokemon battle. The winner is Ash Ketchum from Pallet Town! Not me though, I've beaten him countless times already. With that, we have a Johto photo finish of the Silver Conference. Ash is then supposed to go on to lose in the quarterfinals to some Harrison guy, a character I'm sure nobody remembers. So, Ash once again does not become champion. So it's the end of the road for Ash Ketchum after making it to the final eight. But I am already the Johto champion, so good for me. There are still a few things left to do before we leave Johto. First, I have this egg and I need to hatch it if I can. It becomes a Larvitar. And as cool as this guy is, in the mother of all battles, Ash leaves this little guy in Mount Silver with his mama. Sometimes he can be a good guy, I guess. And since I'm already at Mount Silver, I might as well see what all the fuss is about and head to the summit. I hear it's beautiful up there, and some dude is blocking the view. What a jerk. For this battle, I decided to use only Johto Pokemon, with the exception of Pikachu, of course. We both start with our Pikas, but mine outspeeds to take out the lesser rodent. The Espeon is probably his most concerning Pokemon, because I'm not sure how many of my guys can survive even a single Psychic. 
I decide to paralyze him to start and consider swapping, but that's just another turn of risking a hit. Instead, I leave Pikachu in, go for a Thunderbolt, and take him right out. I guess I should have done that in the first place. Yet again, I wasted a turn paralyzing for no reason. The Snorlax uses Amnesia as I pivot to Heracross. I miss the first Megahorn, darn 85% accurate move, and hit the second one, doing a ton of damage. At this HP, Reversal, which is 100% accurate, should be enough to finish off the Lax. Since Venusaur only knows grass moves, it's safe to stay in, and I take him out with a couple of returns, getting some leftovers healing in the process. Next, Charizard comes out. I don't know why he didn't earlier, so I bring out Cyndaquil on a wing attack. I decide to risk a crit and throw some smoke in Charizard's face. I can then pivot to a Totodile, who avoids two flamethrowers like a boss and responds with surfs. Last is another Blastoise, but I feel like I just defeated one. My Water Croc trades Surf with a Water Turtle, but I do significantly less. Bayleaf comes out to tank a Critical Surf and baits out a Blizzard, which thankfully misses the Pikachu, who finishes off the run with one last Thunderbolt. And with that, Ash has not only become the champion of Johto, but he's also defeated the strongest trainer in the region. I'm glad we ended this run on a high note here, beating both Red and Blagari first try. Somehow, I'm not entirely sure how that happened. Regardless, with significantly more deaths than in Part 1, Ash is now the champion of both Kanto and Johto. Goodbye Brock and Misty, I'm sure we'll never see either of you again. Ash is already feeling nostalgic for the good old days of Kanto, so he decides to head to Hoenn alone with only his Pikachu. I want it to be just like the first time I left Pallet Town. Mika! I am, obviously, going to continue doing this series, but it takes a long time to make these particular videos. So subscribe, and don't forget to watch some of my other challenge videos while you're here. As he prepares to head toward the Hoenn region, Ash's thoughts are on new Pokemon to discover, new battles to be fought, and new friendships waiting to be made.